Assalamu alaikum. I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a presentation to embryology of the arteries and then we will talk about embryology of the veins. Starting with the embryology of the art, the first artery that will be uh, described is the dorsal aorta. The uh, dorsal aorta, as we had uh, an introduction in the presentation of the heart, we have an angiogenetic cell clusters that develops in the visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm. These angiogenetic cell clusters in the visceral layer of lateral plate of mesoderm will form blood cells and the blood vessels. Because these blood cells and the blood vessels develop anteriorly then posteriorly, so in earlier stages the angiogenetic cell cluster will form U-shaped heart tube. The U-shaped heart tube derived from the angiogenic cell clusters anteriorly, then will form the heart tube and then will form the heart loop. And this is a demonstration, although it is for a chicken embryo, showing that anteriorly uh, the angiogenic cell clusters is forming a heart loop. The angiogenic cell clusters caudally will form right and left dorsal aorta the bilateral dorsal aorta. This bilateral dorsal aorta affected by lateral folding of the embryo, you know the embryo will be folded anterior posteriorly and laterally, the lateral folding of the embryo will result in a fusion of the right and left dorsal aorta to form a single dorsal aorta as this sample of chicken embryo, which is older than the sample of this chicken embryo. Here, because the lateral folding occurs in older stage of chicken embryo, the right and left dorsal aorta now fused to form a single dorsal aorta that later on will form the descending thoracic and descending abdominal aorta. Such a fusion occurs, uh, does not occur in the head region. In the head region, the dorsal aorta remain as bilateral right and left uh, because the head region contains much head mesenchyme that prevent the fusion of the bilateral dorsal aorta, while caudally all the dorsal aorta is fused into a single dorsal aorta. This demonstration also shows many opening in this song single dorsal aorta, which are opening of the intersegmental branches from the dorsal aorta that are uh, running in between the somat somatic segments of the embryo. The second artery uh, of the embryo is the umbilical artery I and mean, of course as this figure shows, uh, this is uh, a figure for the human embryo, it shows that the umbilical arteries are bilateral arteries, they are right and left arteries connecting the dorsal aorta to the placenta. Uh, you can see that this dorsal aorta which is descending aorta dividing into right and left uh, common iliac arteries and you can see the connection of the bilateral dorsal aorta between the placenta and the dorsal aorta. After birth, the umbilical artery is the proximal part of the umbilical artery after birth, will form the internal iliac artery and will form a branch from the internal iliac artery to the urinary bladder which is called superior vesical artery. So after birth, remnants of the umbilical artery will form internal iliac artery and its superior vesical branch supplying the upper surface of urinary bladder. While the distal part of the umbilical artery after birth will be closed uh, after birth to form a fibrous cord that is covered by the medial umbilical peritoneal ligament. The third artery in the embryo is the uh, vatiline artery and as uh, this figure of a human embryo shows that there are many branches from the ventral aspect of the single dorsal aorta that are called vatiline arteries going via the yolk sac stack into the, vital, the yolk sac. So many vatiline arteries supplying the yolk sac and are branches, these vatiline arteries are branches from the aorta. Remnants of these vital line arteries will form branches to the gut, which are namely celiac trunk, 
superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery. So celiac trunk supply the foregut, superior mesenteric artery supply the uh, derivatives of the midgut and the inferior mesenteric artery supply derivatives of the hand gut. All these three celiac, superior and inferior mesenteric arteries are derived from the remnants of the vital line arteries which are branches from the single dorsal aorta to the sock sac in early stages of development. Also, uh, the fourth artery of the embryo are the aortic arches. And this figure also shows branches from the dorsal, uh, from the dorsal aorta uh, to the pharyngeal arches, which are called aortic arches. From the presentation of the uh, pharyngeal arches, we know that each of the pharyngeal arches have its own nerve. For example, uh, the first arch has trigeminal nerve, the second arch has facial nerve, the third arch has a glossopharyngeal nerve, which all of are uh, cranial nerves supplying the pharyngeal arches, the mesoderm of pharyngeal arches. But in addition to, the, to a specific nerve for each pharyngeal arch, each pharyngeal arch has also an artery, which is called the aortic arch. And you can see here that the head region shows bilateral dorsal aorta because they are not, the dorsal aorta right and left are not fused in the head region, while caudally the dorsal aorta is single, as you can see. So you can see that the aortic arches are paired arches, right and left. Uh, each of uh, them originates from right and left dorsal aorta respectively. And they are actually six pairs of aortic arches originating from the, uh, uh, or connecting the dorsal aorta with the uh, ascending aorta, which is the root of the aorta, sometimes called aortic sac. You know, this aortic sac or root of ascending aorta is a derivative of the truncus arteriosus. So this aortic sac derived from the truncus arteriosus is connected to the right and left dorsal aorta by six pairs of aortic arches. The fifth aortic arch in a human is uh, rudimentary or absent because the sixth pharyngeal arch also in a human is absent. And therefore, if we consider this diagram as a representation for the pharyngeal arches, that are extending between the right and left dorsal aorta and the aortic sac or the ascending aorta, we must find uh, derivatives from or structures or arteries derived from these aortic arches that will result in final configuration that we know in anatomy. In anatomy, uh, we have pulmonary trunk and ascending aorta. Ascending aorta continues with the arch of the aorta the arch of the aorta continues as descending thoracic and descending abdominal aorta. This is the normal configuration. You know that the arch of the aorta gave right brachiocephalic trunk that divides into right common carotid and right subclavian artery. The right common carotid artery divides into internal and external carotid arteries, while after the brachiocephalic branch, which is the first branch from the arch of the aorta, uh, we have uh, the uh, left common carotid artery and then the left subclavian artery. So the left subclavian, left common carotid and right brachiocephalic artery are branches from the arch of the aorta. And you can see this configuration must be understood in, understood in term of being derived from this from these uh, aortic arches. So we will uh, describe each of these arches in terms of structures derived from it. Starting with the first aortic arch, the first aortic arch will disappear, but remnant of it will form the maxillary artery. And uh, in anatomy, you have to remember that the external um, uh, carotid artery terminates uh, behind the neck of the mandible, the external carotid artery will terminate behind the neck of the mandible in the head by dividing into superficial temporal artery 
and maxillary artery supplying the maxilla bone of the skull. And therefore, this maxillary artery is a remnant of, of the first aortic arch when it will disappear. The second aortic arch will also disappear and remnants of it will form the hyoidal artery supplying the hyoid bone in the neck. And also remnants of the second aortic arch will form the stapedial artery that uh, supply uh, the stapedius bone, or stapes bone and the stapedius muscle, uh, which are in the middle ear. So the second aortic arch will disappear, remnant of it from hyoidal artery to the hyoid bone, and the stapedial artery to stapes bone of middle ear and the stapedius muscle of middle ear. Derivatives from the third aortic arch. If you compare this figure with its coloration, with that figure here, you can see that the third aortic arch forms the common carotid artery and the beginning of the internal or carotid artery or the proximal part of the internal carotid artery. Because continuation or distal part of the internal carotid artery is from the dorsal aorta, as it is shown, when you compare that figure with that. Only the beginning of the internal carotid artery is from the third arch. Distal part of the internal uh, carotid artery is from the dorsal aorta. So the third aortic arch form the common carotid artery and beginning of internal carotid artery. Distal internal carotid is from dorsal aorta. So what about the external carotid artery? Actually, the external carotid artery is not related to development of the aortic arch. The external carotid artery is formed as a bud from the common carotid artery. Therefore, the third aortic arch from right and left common carotid artery and beginning of right and left internal carotid artery. Distal internal carotid is from the dorsal aorta. The external carotid is a bud from the common carotid. And by that we have discussed the derivatives from the first arch, second arch, and third arch. Passing to the structures derived from the fourth aortic arch. You can see uh, from this figure, compared to that figure with its coloration, the fourth aortic arch form a structure that is differ on the left side than the, or the right side. As on the left side, the fourth aortic arch will form the arch of the aorta, while on the right side, the fourth aortic arch will form the uh, Brachiocephalic trunk, which is the beginning of the right subclavian artery, and also it will form uh, the, the other, the distal part of the right subclavian artery, as this figure shown, will be derived from the right dorsal aorta and from the right seventh intersegmental artery. So, the fourth aortic arch on the left side form the arch of the aorta while on the left on the right side it will form the beginning of the right subclavian artery which is the brachiocephalic trunk this third part of the right subclavian artery is derived from the dorsal aorta this piece will form the distal part of the uh, right subclavian artery and also the distal the more distal part of the uh, right subclavian artery is derived from the right seven intersegmental branch of dorsal aorta. You can see that the left subclavian artery is only derived from the left seventh intersegmental artery, while the right subclavian artery is derived from three sources from the fourth right aortic arch, right dorsal aorta, and right seven intersegmental artery. This is all about the right aortic arch. You know, there is no fifth arch because uh, it is rudimentary in a human, and now we will have to pass to the sixth aortic arch. Simply, the sixth aortic arch 
it's called sometimes the pulmonary arch because it will form the pulmonary artery the right and left pulmonary arteries in regard to the pulmonary artery you can see that during development earlier stages the pulmonary artery is represented by the six aortic arch and uh, as any of other aortic arches the six aortic arch extends between the dorsal aorta and the aortic sac which is ascending aorta but what's going on that the connection of the right six uh, uh, aortic arch with the dorsal aorta is uh, lost this piece the connection of the right six aortic arch with the dorsal aorta is lost while the connection of the left six aortic arch with the dorsal aorta remains and this connection is called ductus arteriosus it is important in fetus because you don't need to push the blood by the umbilical uh, by the pulmonary arteries to the lung because the lung is not functioning in fetus and therefore most of the blood that is uh, pushed by the heart by the right ventricle will pass into the pulmonary trunk and then to the pulmonary artery will not be in need to reach the lung and thus this blood in the pulmonary artery will be deviated via the ductus arteriosus to the arch of the aorta or to the descending aorta and uh, thus it will be distributed to the body of the fetus so the ductus arteriosus which is the connection of the right six aortic arch of the left six aortic arch with the uh, aorta is very important to deviate the blood from the pulmonary artery to the uh, systemic dorsal aorta actually this uh, ductus arteriosus will close after birth from the ligamentum arteriosum that is an anatomy a fibrous tissue between the arch of the aorta and the left pulmonary artery this is all about embryology of the aortic arches during that transformation of the aortic arches from that figure into that figure certain parts of the dorsal aorta will disappear and these part disappears are represented in this figure in dotted lines first part that is disappear of the dorsal aorta are the bilateral dorsal aorta between the uh, third and fourth aortic arch this is it. this piece of the dorsal aorta between the third and fourth aortic arches will disappear and this part is called carotid arch of dorsal aorta the other part of dorsal aorta that will disappear is uh, between the right dorsal aorta and uh, between the seven sig uh, right se seven segmental intersegmental artery and the fusion of the right and left dorsal aorta you know the dorsal aorta are right and left in the head region but dorsally they are one dorsal aorta so the fusion of the right and left dorsal aorta is at this point which is this point here so the dorsal aorta between the point of fusion of the bilateral dorsal aorta and the origin of the uh, right seventh intersegmental artery this piece will also disappear of course this right seventh intersegmental artery will be distal part of right subclavian artery so we can say uh, the dorsal aorta between distal right subclavian artery and the union of right and left subclavian artery will disappear Another point which is of significance during development of the aortic arches. You know, uh, in the presentation of the cardiac development, of the heart development, we said that the anterior posterior folding of the embryo uh, changed the position of the cardiogenic field from a region anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane to become ventral to the bucopharyngeal membrane, and then the cardiogenic field will become caudal to the bucopharyngeal membrane as a result of this deviation 
uh, and position of the cardiogenic field, the heart will deviate from the neck into the thorax. So uh, the heart descends from the neck into the thorax during development. As a result of this descent of the heart, there will be two changes. First of all, there will be shortening of the arch of the aorta. You know, this is the arch of the aorta. It gives a brachiocephalic trunk, uh, left common carotid artery, and left subclavian artery. So it is here uh, a long distance, but this long distance will be shortened when the heart descends from the neck into the thorax. The second change, you can see that the recurrent laryngeal branch of vagus nerve is near to the sixth aortic arch because both the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the sixth aortic arches are uh, suppliers to the sixth pharyngeal arch. We said that the mesoderm of each of the pharyngeal arches supplied by a single nerve, a specific nerve, and a specific artery. The nerve is a cranial nerve, and the artery is the aortic arches. And so the sixth pharyngeal arch, the mesoderm of sixth pharyngeal arch, contains the recurrent laryngeal nerve as a specific nerve for it, and the sixth aortic arch as an artery for it. And you can see, therefore, that the recurrent laryngeal nerves hooks around the sixth aortic arch. This recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch from the vagus nerve. As you can see, it forms a hook around the sixth aortic arch. During descent of the heart from the neck to the thorax, the sixth aortic arch on the left side will push the hook of the recurrent laryngeal nerve downward into the thorax. Therefore, in anatomy, you will find that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is in the thorax, hooking around the ligamentum arteriosum, which is remnant of ductus arteriosus connecting the sixth arch on the left side with the aorta. And we described that before a while. Well, on the right side, because the connection of the sixth aortic arch is lost from uh, its connection with the dorsal aorta. We said that before a while, that the sixth aortic arch on the right loses connection with the uh, right dorsal aorta, while the sixth aortic arch on the left remains connected, forming ductus arteriosus. This remnants of the ductus arteriosus will push the recurrent laryngeal nerve down with the descent of the heart, and thus you will find that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is in the thorax, pushed by this ductus arteriosus. Such a pushing is not occurring on the right side because uh, the part of the sixth arch that is hooked by the right recurrent laryngeal nerve disappears. Therefore, when the heart descends, you will find that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is hooking around the fourth arch, which is the right subclavian artery. Anomalies of the cardiovascular system in general are many. And we will enumerate some of these. We said in presentation of the cardiac development that anomalies could be diagnosed clinically and by cardiac catheterization. So it is a big topic actually. But from the anomalies, we said that the ductus arteriosus uh, connecting the uh, left sixth aortic arch with the dorsal aorta must disappear or closed after birth forming ligamentum arteriosum. If it is not closed, it will remain between the pulmonary artery and the arch of the aorta and is called patent ductus arteriosus. You can diagnose that clinically by hearing a murmur on the chest wall with a stethoscope or by cardiac, cardiac catheterization and of course, such a patent ductus arteriosus will allow blood from the pulmonary artery to escape into the arch of the aorta, and this is uh, not for the benefit of the uh, newborn, so it must be closed after birth by surgical operation, the patent ductus arteriosus. 
Another anomaly, an example for an anomaly in the artery is narrowing of the aorta, uh, which is called coarctation of the aorta. Another abnormality is that uh, the right subclavian artery uh, will be originated abnormally. The right subclavian artery is usually derived from three sources, which are the uh, proximal part from the right third arch and distal part from dorsal aorta and uh, seventh intersegmental artery on the right side. But here, uh, the right subclavian artery, as it is shown in this figure, is derived from the arch of the aorta, and this just like the left subclavian artery. And this right subclavian artery must pass to the right, it will pass behind the trachea and esophagus, thus, it may produce difficulty in breathing or difficulty in swallowing the abnormal right subclavian artery. Also, sometimes you have. Uh, double aortic arch enclosing the oesophagus and trachea and thus also result in difficulty in the breathing and the swallowing. Regarding embryology of the venous system, we said in uh, description to the embryology of the heart that the heart tube is formed of four parts, bulbous, cordes, ventricle, atrium, and then sinus venosus from anterior to posterior. And we will start the description to development of the venous system from the transverse part or called body of sinus venosus. And if you remember that this transverse part of body of sinus venosus uh, is connected to horns, right and left horns of sinus venosus. And each horn of sinus venosus receives three tributaries, the common cardinal vein, the umbilical vein, and the vital line vein. And so, to describe embryology of the venous system, we will start with embryology of the tributaries of the sinus horn, the vital line veins, the umbilical veins, and then the cardinal vein, the common cardinal vein. You can see in this figure that the vital line vein are the most medial vein, of course they are bilateral vital line veins, are the most medial, they are on the size of the midline or we can say they are on the size of the gut tube. And more lateral to the vital line veins are the umbilical veins which are right and left also bilateral. And more laterally are the common cardinal veins. So, starting with embryology of the vital line veins, the most medial. The vital line veins are on the size of the duodenum, and uh, they are running in the septum transversum, which, are, which is a mesodermal tissue separating the thorax from the abdomen. Therefore, the septum transversum is like a diaphragm in human, in uh, adult. So the bilateral uh, vital line veins are running on the sides of the duodenum and the septum transversum. These bilateral uh, veins uh, surrounding the duodenum, later on they will uh, show the liver that grows from the duodenum as a bud. And because the liver grows in the, from the duodenum in between the right and left vital line vein, the growth of the liver will incorporate the bilateral vital line veins. Therefore, when the liver is enlarged, it will incorporate the vital line veins. And so, the vital line veins will form sinusoids of the liver and they will form portal vein. You can see that uh, the connection of the vital line vein with the sinus venosus is called hepatocardiac channel. The right hepatocardiac channel, this one, not the left, the right, will form part of inferior vena cava that is found in anatomy on the posterior surface of the liver, which is called hepatic part of inferior vena cava. 
So the hepatic part of inferior vena cava is derived from the right hepatocardiac channel connecting the right vital line vein with sinus venosus. This is all about the vital line vein. The more lateral are the, the umbilical arteries. They are lateral to the vital line veins. These are the vital line veins on the side of the duodenum. More laterally are the umbilical veins. Again, the umbilical arteries will be on the sides of the liver. And the liver, we saw it before a while, enlarged to incorporate, to incorporate the vital line veins. This liver will enlarge more and more and it will incorporate, uh, incorporate the umbilical veins also, just like it was incorporating the vital line vein, the growth of the liver will incorporate, in incorporate also the umbilical veins. So, the umbilical veins finally will be connected with the liver, with the sinusoids of the liver. Later on, the right umbilical vein will start to degenerate, as you can see in this figure, and then it will disappear, and later on we will find only the left umbilical vein extending between the liver to the umbilicus and then umbilical cord. Later on we will find that we have only a one left umbilical vein because the right umbilical vein will degenerate later on. Actually, the umbilical vein, as it is the only vein, which is the left umbilical vein, will be very important in that case because this vein will bring all the nutrient and oxygen to the embryo and fetus. And you can see that this uh, umbilical vein will bring oxygen and nutrient, this oxygen and nutrient uh, brought by the um, left umbilical vein must pass through the sinusoids of the liver then to hepato, right hepatocardiac channel which is inferior vena cava then the heart and because the embryo is always growing we must convey oxygen and the nutrient coming from the left umbilical vein rapidly into the heart the flow of blood from the umbilical vein to the heart via the liver will be slow because uh, the umbilical uh, blood in the left umbilical vein must pass into the sinusoids of the liver which are capillaries and of course this is a slow circulation to reach the hepatocardiac channel which is hepatic inferior vena cava in the heart. Therefore, a big duct will be formed inside the liver, which is called ductus venosus. This ductus venosus will allow rapid flow of umbilical blood flow of, of blood, fl blood flow from the left umbilical artery will pass rapidly into this ductus venosus to the inferior vena cava and then to the heart. Of course, after birth, this duct the ductus venosus is not needed and it will be closed to forming uh, what's uh, called ligamentum venosum. The ductus venosus will form ligamentum venosum. Even the uh, left umbilical vein after birth will be closed and it will form ligamentum teres. That is at the lower border of falciform ligament. Finally, we will pass to the most lateral uh, tributary of the sinus horn, which are the common cardinal veins. Common cardinal veins draining the body of embryo by anterior, by anterior and posterior branches. So you can see that the common cardinal, which is one of the tributary, the lateral tributary of the sinus horn, divides into anterior cardinal and posterior cardinal each of these draining the anterior and posterior parts of the body of the embryo respectively. But at the fifth and seventh week of development, there will be more cardinal veins to develop. 
the newer cardinal veins to be developed uh, in, uh, during the period between the fifth to seventh week. These new cardinal veins are shown here. This is a demonstration for the right and left common cardinal veins that are dividing into anterior cardinal and posterior cardinal draining the body of the embryo. And as we said, that uh, newer cardinal veins are uh, developing in uh, the uh, five to seven week. These new cardinal veins are subcardinal veins that are draining the kidney, sacrocardinal veins, of course bilateral, draining the lower limb, so right and left subcardinal veins draining the kidney, right and left sacrocardinal veins draining the lower limb, and supracardinal veins, right and left supracardinal veins draining the chest wall, the intercostal spaces. These are subcardinal, sacrocardinal, and supracardinal, the new cardinal veins. So from these collections of cardinal veins, common cardinal, anterior cardinal, posterior cardinal, supracardinal, subcardinal, and sacrocardinal. There will be a, a formation of the great veins of the body. So, in summary, the great veins of the body will be derived as following. First, we will start with the development of the inferior vena cava. Before a while, we had learned that the right hepatocardiac channel from the hepatic part of inferior vena cava behind the liver. So the first part of inferior vena cava is hepatic part of inferior vena cava, which is derived from the right vital line vein, specifically from the right hepatocardiac channel, which is derived from right vital line vein. Then, there will be a subcardinal part of inferior vena cava or renal part of inferior vena cava derived from the subcardinal vein. And then on the right side, of course. And then finally, there will be a sacrocardinal part of inferior vena cava derived from the right sacrocardinal vein. Therefore, you can see that the left sacrocardinal, left subcardinal will degenerate. Actually, a degeneration of the left, sac sac left sacrocardinal will form uh, the left gonadal vein uh, and the left suprarenal vein. So, the inferior vena cava is derived from the right vital line vein, in which it will form hepatic part of inferior vena cava. Also, the inferior vena cava is derived from the right subcardinal vein, which is the renal part of inferior vena cava. And also, the inferior vena cava is derived from the right sacrocardinal vein, which is the sacrocardinal part of inferior vena cava. Regarding the superior vena cava, the superior vena cava is derived from the right common cardinal vein and the right anterior cardinal vein, as you can see from comparison of this figure from, with that figure. The azygous vein is derived from the right supracardinal vein, but the proximal part of the azygous, drawn here in the black, which is the arch of azygous vein connected with the superior vena cava, is derived from remnant of posterior cardinal vein. The accessory hemiazygous and the hemiazygous are derived from the left supracardinal vein. Anomalies of the veins are also many, include double vena cava. We said that the vena cava is derived only from the left, from the right sacrocardinal vein. Here you can see that both the right and left sacrocardinal form inferior vena cava, so we have double inferior vena cava. Here we have absence of inferior vena cava, because here you can see that the hepatic, uh, the subcardinal uh, inferior vena cava is connected with the azygous. The hepatic part of inferior vena cava is separated from the subcardinal, uh, from uh, renal part of uh, inferior vena cava. Here, the renal part, the subcardinal part 
of inferior vena cava is connected with the azygos, not with the hepatic part of inferior vena cava. So we have double inferior vena cava or absence of inferior vena cava. Again, in the superior vena cava, we may have left superior vena cava that is connected to the uh, left atrium directly, or we may have double inferior vena cava as this figure shows. Double inferior vena cava. Uh, sorry, superior vena cava. So either we have left superior vena cava or double superior vena cava. Fetal circulation is one of the important subjects that must be remembered uh, after this uh, review to embryology of the arteries and veins because of its clinical significance. You can imagine in this figure that oxygen and the nutrient come from the placenta via the left umbilical vein. We said that the right umbilical vein will be closed and the only vein that remains is the left umbilical vein. This oxygen and the nutrient from the left umbilical vein must pass into the liver and the blood will run in the sinuses of the liver but this flow is slow so most of the blood from the left umbilical vein must pass through the big ductus venosus of the liver to reach the hepatic part of the inferior vena cava that lie on the back of the liver and then the blood from hepatic part of the inferior vena cava will reach to the right atria here also blood will be drained by the superior vena cava from the upper limb and head and neck and the blood collected in the right atrium from the superior vena cava and from vena cava inferior vena cava will pass via the secondary ostium which is an opening in the arterial septum sometimes called foramen ovale the blood coming from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava will pass mostly into the ostium secundum into the left atrium. The left atrium pushes the blood to the left ventricle and the left ventricle pushes the blood via the ascending aorta, arch of aorta, descending aorta, the descending aorta will convey the blood to the umbilical arteries, the right and left umbilical arteries that will be returned to the placenta. Apart from this circulation, you can see that some of the blood in the right atrium will be pushed to the right ventricle, and the right ventricle will push the blood to the pulmonary uh, trunk and pulmonary arteries. Most of the blood in the pulmonary artery and the trunk will pass back to the arch of the aorta via the ductus arteriosus. Of course at birth you don't need umbilical artery, uh, uh, sorry umbilical vein, so it will obliterate to form the gamentum teres at birth. And you will not need the ductus venosus it will obliterate to form the ligamentum venosa. And also you don't need a foramen ovale. It will be closed to form fossa ovale. And you don't need ductus arteriosus. It will form ligamentum arteriosum. And you don't need the distal part of the umbilical arteries that will obliter uh, obliterate uh, to form uh, a fibrous tissue covered by peritoneum called medial umbilical ligament. You know proximal parts of the umbilical arteries will remain. The proximal part of the umbilical artery will form the internal iliac artery and superior vesical branch from internal iliac artery. But distal part of the umbilical arteries will form a fibrous tissue covered by medial umbilical ligament of the peritoneum. Finally, there are three knots 
to be remembered. The first knot. We said that each of the horns of sinus venosus, the left horn of sinus venosus, and the right horn of sinus venosus that are connected to transverse part or called body of sinus venosus. You can see from this figure that the left horn of sinus venosus will degenerate later on in development. And this degenerated left horn of sinus venosus will form only oblique vein of the left atrium and the coronary sinus which is the biggest vein of the heart. So the first knot is that the left horn of sinus venosus mostly will degenerate. Remnant of it form the oblique vein of left atrium and the coronary sinus of the heart. The second knot is that the right horn of sinus venosus and the transverse part of sinus venosus will incorporate into the right atrium. And thus you will find a region in anatomy of the right atrium from inside called sinus venarum of right atrium. This sinus venarum is derived from the sinus venosus. And you can see that the orifice of the uh, sinus, right sinus horn into the right atrium is just like uh, to be guarded by right and left valves. The orifice of the right sinus horn into the right atrium is guarded by right and left valves. These valves of the right horn fuse superiorly the right and left valves of right sinus horn into the right atrium, fuse superiorly to form the septum superium. Later on, the septum superium and the right valve of sinus venosus will fuse, uh, sorry, the left valve of sinus venosus will uh, uh, fuse with the interarterial septum. So the left valve of right sinus horn and the septum superior formed by fusion of the right and left valve, septum superior and left valve, both of these, will be fused with the interarterial septum and contribute to formation of the interarterial septum. But the right valve of right sinus horn would show two fates, two ends. The upper part of the right valve will disappear completely, but the lower part of the right valve will form valve for inferior vena cava and valve for the coronary sinus. The third point is that the pulmonary vein occurs as a bud from the left atrium. This bud of pulmonary vein, later it will divide into right and left pulmonary veins and each of these will divide further and further. The butt of the pulmonary vein will incorporate into the left atrium and it will form the smooth part of left atrium. The interior of the left atrium shows a smooth part which is derived from absorption or incorporation of the pulmonary art vein which is already a bud from the left atrium. And therefore, you may find four openings of four pulmonary veins in the left atrium because as you can see, these uh, divisions of the bud of the pulmonary vein, when it will incorporate into the left atrium, you'll find here the, these four openings indicating these four branches. That is, in summary, the embryology of the vascular system, including the embryology of the arteries and veins. Thank you very much.